start typing. Okay, regarding in progress. We are starting with the interview. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, the first subject, we divided the interview in four topics. Uh, the third subject is meet Dr. Carrie Williams. Dr. Carrie Williams, you are from the state of Wisconsin, which is known for its agriculture and livestock industry. Do you have contact with the agriculture war in your childhood? Um, I didn't do much with the agriculture industry other than with horses, which in the United States, horse, horses are considered agriculture. Um, I started riding and I started in Pony Club when I was about 11 years old. Um, so I started through that and then um, advanced on to different aspects of riding and barn management um, from there. So pretty much through uh, my, my younger years before I moved to college. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, research is an exciting sector that requires many hours of study. Could you tell us when you became interested in horses? Um, yeah, so when I was riding uh, through, um, you know, through school and high school, um, I started doing a lot of reading on the horses and, you know, what kind of research was done and uh, you know, spent a lot of time with our veterinarians and thought that, you know, vet school might be something that I want to do in the future. So uh, that's when I started at looking at uh, some veterinary colleges in uh, in the States. And actually in the United States, we have to go through, uh, we can't go right into a veterinary school. So we have to do four years of college first. So that's when I ended up at Colorado State University, like you mentioned in the bio. Um, so I did that, and um, that's actually when I really started to fall in love with the topic of nutrition. Um, I had some wonderful professors and wonderful classes at Colorado State University that really got me uh, into my nutrition focus. That's right. That's right. As a teacher at Rutgers College, could you tell us uh, what horse-related topics you are studying, uh, your students are most interested in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nutrition definitely comes to be one of the the top uh, you know topics because we've we've got a lot of different topics here from uh, you know anatomy and nutrition, reproductive physiology, uh, behavior, things like that, um, and really nutrition and behavior kind of rise to the top. Um, a lot of our students, um, while they are going off to be veterinarians, uh, a lot of them after they take a lot of the nutrition courses that we require here, uh, really do get um, get more of an interest in nutrition. Um, especially nutrition and how it helps horses, uh, you know, perform uh, to the best of their ability. Okay, perfect. I understand that besides your research studies, you have a mirror that you have trained yourself. What training method you, do you apply? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and actually, I have um, most recently and probably uh, since that bio was written, I actually have a young gelding. Um, he is oh. five years old. Yeah, he's five years old now, uh, but he's very young. He wasn't, uh, you know, he's not an off the track thoroughbred like my mare was. Um, I got her off the track. But um, this guy, he is, he's a very young five-year-old. His brain is very young. Um, so uh, really what I'm doing now is I'm just taking things slowly. Um, while he is bred to do a lot of jumping, um, you know, we're doing a lot of flat work first, doing a lot of dressage. Um, and just kind of feeling out what he wants to do. Um, okay. I'm taking it slow. I'm letting him enjoy uh, his time, trying to do lots of things outside, whether it's trail riding or hacking out in a group, um, cross-country schooling, uh, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, and right now he seems to gravitate more towards the outdoor work than the ring work. Um, granted, since he is pretty young-minded, um, I'm sure that'll come with time, but um, but really, we're kind of not doing as much of the hardcore showing, just more, uh, you know, having fun and learning how to be a horse and liking to be ridden. <laughs> That's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. It's great. <laughs> well, we are uh, going to pass to the other topic, the importance of nutrition and in horse uh, welfare. And the first question is, what are the principles of, of a balanced diet that promotes good health in horses? Mm. I always, no matter who asked me that question, I always start off by saying that forage should always be the focus. Uh, forage should be the base of any diet. 
Um, horses should really be fed to maximize the amount of forage that they're getting. And then we can add in other types of, of feeds, whether it needs to be a concentrate or a vitamin supplement or something like that. Um, but we see what's in the forage first and, and then we go from there. And um, I can pretty much balance any diet um, by looking at the forage first and then seeing what else needs to be offered or, or available. That's right, that's right. Depending on the bread, on the bread of a particular physical trait, uh, should the horse's diet be different? Um, yeah, there is a lot of uh, variability in the, in the different breeds, uh, you know, from whether it's a, a light breed, a, a pony breed or a draft breed, or even some of the warm bloods, um, they do vary quite a lot. Um, I find that the most variability comes in terms of their energy requirements. Um, you know, I've, I've dealt a lot with, and some of my mares have been off the track thoroughbreds. Um, they tend to need a little bit higher energy requirement than, um, say, my young warm blood cross, um, who might seem to be a little bit more um, thrifty in his metabolism and not quite need as much energy to maintain the same body weight. Um, the same goes with different uh, forage qualities. While some of the horses that need a little bit more higher energy requirement might need a little bit higher quality of forage in their diet to help them get some of that, uh, that energy availability. And then we play with some uh, concentrated feeds, whether it be a, a concentrated fat supplement to increase the energy requirement um, or different types of forages in order to, uh, to balance out that energy. But that seems to be the biggest difference, I feel, with, with a lot of the different breeds. Um, and then it just becomes on uh, terms of what type of, you know, exercise or breathing okay. uh, they're doing from there. That's great. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, should protein be reduced in a diet of horses uh, with liver or kidney diseases? Uh, yeah, I've worked with a handful over the years of horses that have liver or kidney problems and, and protein definitely needs to be something to take into consideration. Um, uh, even because really, if you have excess protein in the diet, it's going to be excreted um, as ammonia and urea in the kidneys. So in order to decrease the amount of wear and tear on the kidneys, particularly with older horses with these problems, um, we do need to feed them high quality protein um, and not excess. So they're not worried or, or you know, they're not doing any um, excess excretion. So yeah. Okay, okay. From a, work, uh, from a welfare point of view, given the importance of providing our horses with a balanced diet, could you recommend the four or five type of essential nutrients in a horse's diet for a healthy life? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty big question. I'll try <laughs> okay. to, to, to answer that one. Um, but really all horses require six uh, classes of nutrients, if I can start there. And I know a lot of people tend to forget water, um, but actually water is the most important nutrient. Uh, horses can't live very long without water, uh, two, maybe three days. Um, so that tends to be at the top of the list in terms of nutrients horses require. And then from there, we have things like the protein, which we just talked about, um, fats. And while fats are required, they're only required in really small amounts. Um, unless we have the horses we were talking about, like the, the horses that need higher energy requirements. Um, okay. Carbohydrates um, are those that are needed in the highest uh, amount in terms of, of the, you know, the amount because fiber that is in okay. a lot of the hays and forages okay. is a carbohydrate as well. Um, and then we got vitamins and minerals, which, uh, you know, there, there's, there's plenty of those. Um, and I'm sure eventually we'll get to uh, the question about antioxidants because that is definitely something I'm <laughs> yeah. uh, most passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Stressing horses is the other topic. You have specialized in the use of antioxidant supplements to avoid the stress in those horses with a external, physical, a, a, external physical activity. Could you please mm -hmm. briefly explain some aspects related to these supplements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was a good segue into this. Uh, I did a lot of my work with vitamin E, um, and vitamin okay. E is the most common uh, antioxidant for horses. Um, to me, that's a really good one to start off with, especially with stressed horses that are doing a lot of exercise, a lot of traveling. Um, you know, it, it does get really hard on, on muscles and immune cells and even nervous cells. 
Uh, and a lot of those can be compromised if the horse becomes excessively stressed and might not have uh, enough antioxidants. Um, say they're on a, a little a lower forage diet and they're not getting all their vitamins. Um, so really the, uh, the, the first antioxidant that I always recommend is, is vitamin E just to help with their, uh, their stress level during times of performance, uh, exercise, traveling, things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's great, that's great to know. It's like in humans. It's, exactly. it's, great. it's a great yeah. antioxidant and vitamin E in humans as well. Yeah, and actually that's where a lot of my research came from was looking at the research that's done in humans and kind of transferring it over to horses. Okay, okay, great. Um, one of the most widely used antioxidants in horse is vitamin E. How much vitamin E should we give our horse and in what, circ and in what circumstances? Yeah, that, that's something I, I could have followed up with the last question, definitely. Um, it really depends on, on the horse, what their base diet is and what they're doing. So let me say that in most of my exercise studies, we didn't allow horses on pasture. We just had them on a uh, dried hay forage, which is fairly low in vitamin E. And they were intensely exercising. So a lot of them were doing some endurance work or some, uh, you know, intense treadmill work. And we were feeding them about 5,000 IU, which is an international unit uh, yes. of measure for vitamins per day. Um, and that, that's a pretty high amount. But given their amount of exercise and the lack of the vitamin E in the diet, that really did help the horses that... Um, you know, had some muscle difficulties, uh, some immune compromise, compromisation um, as, as well. So the 5,000 IU is kind of a, a high level, but it was needed for some of these horses. Um, a lot of the horses I consult with now, they might be allowed a little bit of pasture. They might not be in, as intensely working. Um, or even if they're on maybe a natural form of vitamin E, you can probably get by with about 2,000 IU um, of vitamin E per day in those sorts of situations. Oh, that's great. It's good to know. This is it's great to know. Um, the, the, the physiological demands of athletic performance are high. What diet should we give our horse to compensate for that? And what physical consequences can that bring about if we do not control it? Mm. That's a tough question. There's there's a lot of variables that go behind that. Um, you know, I think really just starting off and making sure that they're on a well balanced diet is is first and foremost. Um, once you start getting into the um, all the balance of the minerals, minerals, mineral nutrition is very complicated. Um, yeah. It's probably one of uh, my most difficult topics because there's so many different interactions with all the minerals. Um, so really just to make sure that they're on a balanced diet, um, a formulated diet for their particular uh, type of exercise and a very high quality forage. Um, I think those are kind of the main things to start with. Uh, and then from there, if they if they have a performance issue, if they have a, a joint problem or, uh, you know, some muscle conditions or, you know, immune compromised or things like that, then maybe we can add some supplements in there that might help them out. Um, but I really think just starting off with uh, the basics of the diet in terms of the nutrient classes that we uh, just talked about, um, that's kind of first and foremost. Um, because if we don't have that balanced diet, you're going to start to see not just a poor performance, you know, they're not going to run as fast or they'll fatigue quicker, uh, you know, or they'll ha start to have some, uh, some muscle degeneration. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they'll also start to lose weight. Um, and really, you know, nobody likes to see, uh, you know, a, a really skinny horse that's performing, doing anything. So, um, so yeah, I, I always like to take the individual horse and, uh, and look and see kind of what its diet is and, and what it's doing, uh, before making any recommendation. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, athletic performance requires physio uh, physiological preparation in order to manage stress. In the case of performance horses, how can we reduce stress? Mm, that's a really good question. So aside from diet, which we talked about vitamin E and stuff helping out, um, I, you know, I think that falls on, on the trainer and the rider um, really to, uh, to prepare the horse adequately. You know, um, let's take, for example, my young horse. Okay. Uh, he, um, he qualified for a national competition last year as a four-year-old. 
and we needed to travel about 12 hours to get to the competition. Um, so instead of just throwing them on the trailer and going, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, of preparation, um, taking them different places uh, that might be more local or closer uh, and getting him exposed to different things before just expecting him to perform 12 hours away from home in a situation that's, you know, at the national level instead of the local level. So, you know, I think it's all about getting the horse out there, getting them acclimated to different situations, different showgrounds, different experiences, whether it's in the ring or like I mentioned, outside of the ring, uh, you know, in a field, um, you know, looking, being in a ring with other horses, uh, you know, it was really funny. I, when I first got my young horse, I didn't realize, you know, they never really rode him with a lot of other horses. So at his first show, when he had to be in a warm up ring with 10 other horses, okay. <laughs> he didn't know what to do. He was like, I, there's too many other horses around me. And, he just and they used to live, uh, and naturally they, 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 uh, they used to live in pack uh, yeah. uh, in the carrot. So, right. you know, uh, yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I think it is all about preparation um, and, and just getting them exposed to different situations um, before before you really put a lot of stress on them to compete. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so we are to another topic, the importance of grazing and feeding horses naturally. Grazing and natural diet are key points that every nutrition recommends. It is is, is it that correct or does it only apply in certain circumstances? No, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, every nutritionist I know uh, does focus on, you know, like I said, the forage first and grazing is really a big, a big part of it. Um, you know, it's the foundation. Um, it, that's where the horses get majority of their vitamins from uh, is green grass. You know, I, I always tell my my students and those that I educate, you know, we always tell our children that you need to eat your green vegetables to get your vitamins. Yes. Well, it's no different for horses. You yeah. know, that's where their vitamins come from and their green vegetables is, is grass uh, and grazing. A lot of green. We have to, to eat a lot of green. It, it's, exactly. it, that is right. What recommendations, what aspects should be considered when choosing the type of grass or pasture for our horses? I think a combination goes between not to, not what's just right for horses, but what's right for the typical environment that the horse is grazing in. Okay. Um, because there's so many different types of grasses and um, I might want to graze one particular type of grass, but if it doesn't grow in your area and in your pasture, it's not going to be appropriate. So really good pasture management stems from uh, knowing knowing the soil, um, knowing the nutrients that the soil needs and knowing what grows best in your area. Um, you know, I can tell you a lot about what grows really well here in New Jersey, uh, okay. but it's definitely not going to be appropriate uh, in Argentina. Yeah, in Argentina. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that. Uh, yeah, in Argentina <laughs> and specifically in Sierra Valley where we, we breed our horses. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Especially um, there, or in the north of Argentina, in Salta as well. So exactly, and that's the same I mean, with our with the United States. Um, we've got totally different grasses here as they grow in the southern part of the U.S. Yeah. Okay. What recommendations can you give to organic horse farms regarding to the uh, regarding the fodder and pastures that they should feed their animals? Yeah. I think one of the biggest things I see in this country anyway is the uh, amount of weed growth in pastures, um, weeds that horses shouldn't eat uh, or won't eat that um, overwhelm the pasture and the grasses. And a lot of people think that the weeds are taking over when really they need to focus on good pasture management that will outcompete the weeds. Um, so I think a, a big one is if they have too much land or not enough horses grazing on the property, they need to do regular mowing. And a lot of people think that the horses are just going to mow the grass grasses themselves and they won't ever need to mow. Well, the problem becomes is once the weeds get to a certain height, they're going to flower or they're going to produce a seed okay. and they can produce millions of seeds. <laughs> That once they, you know, hit the air, um, are going to populate and, and then, yes, they can take over the pastures. So I think weed control is a really big part of pasture management that a lot of horse farms and horse farm owners um, overlook. 
Um, it's a very complicated topic. I'm not saying it's anything easy that I can give a tutorial on right okay. now. Um, but, uh, you know, wherever there's a possibility of finding someone locally that can help with any weed control um, or even just mowing the pastures regularly to keep the weeds down is a big thing because it won't just help the grasses grow healthy. It'll help the horses consume healthy grass. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so it's, it didn't recommend it. In the horse industry, there are many people involved, such as farm managers, riding instructors, trainers, or vets. Which of them do you think should be trained in equine nutrition? Mm -hmm. Anyone who has anything to say about what the horses are eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in some barns, that could be everybody. It could be the owner, the rider, the trainer, uh, the veterinarian. It could be uh, all of them. Um, you know, but in some situations, the owner has nothing to do with what the horses eat. So maybe they're not as important to know about their horse's nutrition. However, me as an owner, granted I'm a nutritionist, but I really okay. want to know what my horse is eating. Um, so because of that, I've actually created an online class. It's taught okay. every spring and it's for horse owners, trainers, veterinarians. It's for people in the industry that want to learn more about their horse's nutrition, or I've had barn managers take it. I've had trainers take it, owners take it. I've had a little bit of everybody take it. And globally, I've had, you know, students all over the world, uh, you know, uh, more recently, Brazil, France, Australia, I've had students from all over. Our um, neighbor, Brazil is our neighbor. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. it's just about us. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, if, if anyone, you know, maybe at the end we can share my contact in information. Uh, you know, if anybody is really interested in learning more about, uh, it, you know, about their horse's nutrition, um, you know, this class might be ideal for them. Um, you that know, would not be to great. Like a commercial. Um, but I really have had a lot oh, of people right. say it's, they've learned so much just in what to feed their horses or their horses on their property. Um, and it was really valuable for them. Okay, that would be great to promote. Uh, yeah. Uh, a good use of fodder and pasture also helps pro protect environments. Uh, what factors should we take into account to achieve this? Say that one more time. I'm not sure I totally understood that question. Okay. Just repeat that. Can you repeat it? Okay. A, a good use of fodder and pastures also helps protect the environment. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What factors should we take into account to achieve this? Got it. Okay. I understand now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so on top of what I was talking about with the weeds, because, you know, weeds can be an environmental problem as well, um, but also the more forage that you have in your pasture, the thicker, the denser the grass is, it actually, it helps the soil quality and it helps prevent a lot of erosion. Um, so if you, the less grass you have, the more erosion you have, if you have big rainstorms or if you have uneven ground, um, you also uh, can help control, um, uh, control not just uh, water erosion, but also water health, because what happens, a lot of the manure that's dropped from the horses has a lot of excess nutrients in it that the grasses uh, that, that aren't supposed to be in the waterways like phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, potassium. A lot of those uh, that end up in the waterway might not be great for the water, but it's great for the plants. Okay. So a lot of the grasses will actually consume some of this excess nutrients um, and it won't go off and pollute the waterways. So there's kind of this, this water, soil, pasture, animal, um, we call it nutrient cycling or nutrient okay. recycling. Um, and there's a lot of work that's been done, and I've only just touched the surface of some of the work with uh, with a lot of the environmental um, benefits of keeping horses on pasture and keeping good quality pasture. Okay, we are keeping horses on pasture. We are uh, we we breed in open field <laughs> horses. <Right>. Yeah, <laughs> we we breed in open field. Um, the, the last question of this: Can you explain what rotational grazing is exactly? and how important it is for the environment and for, for horses' welfare. Yeah, so rotational grazing is something that I've started working on, um, you know, about eight years ago or so. 
Um, it's different than what we consider continuous grazing, which is typical what most horse farmers do. You know, they've got a big field, they've got 10, 12 horses, they turn all the horses out in the field and they graze either half the day or the full day, but they're never, they're never moved out of that pasture um, unless, I don't know, unless something happens to the pasture. But rotational grazing is taking that same size pasture, say it's a five acre pasture, and dividing it into three, four, or even five sections. So you'll maybe divide it into one acre sections or one and a half acre sections. And then you'll take these horses and you'll move them through each section. So you'll only let them graze a small area at a time. They'll graze the, say the, the forage height is 15 centimeters and they'll graze that down to about seven centimeters. Then you'll move them out of that pasture where the pasture is now 15 centimeters and you'll graze it back down and you'll keep rotating the horses through to always graze on nice, good, decent quality forage. Meanwhile, you're letting the original pasture that's been grazed down to a smaller amount regrow. And by letting the pasture regrow, oh, you're helping decrease weed uh, in, uh, uh, production. You're also helping keep the, uh, the grasses continuously growing and you're not gonna overgraze the field so that you always have a short amount of grass. Horses love to select things. I say they're like children. <laughs> Horses are like kids because they love what tastes good. If you give a kid a choice of a piece of broccoli or a candy bar, they're going to choose the candy bar. Well, <laughs> horses in the same way, they like to eat what's good and they're going to graze the shorter grasses because it has more of the, the sugars and the starches and the thing that tastes better. I Not never try better. that. I never try yeah. that. <laughs> so we move the horses through these fields and then we kind of rotate them around as the grasses grow back and it just helps keep the pasture you something and helps keep more available. In the past, we uh, we we use uh, we use sometimes uh, sugar cubes to horses, mm -hmm. and they loved they loved it, loved it, loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the 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 final topic is the boon of equestrian tourism. Uh, equestrian tourism is becoming increasingly popular. Do you think that the diet of those horses used on equestrian street should be different from others? I think their diet is very important. Um, I think they should be treated like performance horses or exercising horses because they are, that's what they are. They, uh, you know, they're traveling a lot. They're under different yeah. situations. So, um, you know, if if I were in charge, I would, um, would treat them just like a performance horse, you know, maybe, you know, make sure that their forage is very high quality forage, maybe supplement them with some antioxidants. Um, things like that. Make sure that their energy is is at a level where they can sustain the amount of work that they need to do on a on a daily basis. Okay. Have you had the the opportunity to practice equestrian touring and where? Unfortunately, not a whole lot. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues have done a lot of riding vacations and things in different countries. Um, a really good friend of mine did a honeymoon in uh, Ireland and oh, wow. decided they rode all week. I have some other colleagues who went on a riding safari in South Africa. Um, I know a lot of friends who have done a lot of really uh, nice sort of riding vacations or, or agro-tourism, um, but I haven't been able to be as involved in that uh, personally. Um, I would love okay. to do something. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Uh, okay, Adam Pascacci, uh, we are Peruvian horse breeders. Uh, and we use Peruvian in our rides. Do you know the breed? Uh, if you can, uh, if you can, uh, you tell us if there are special considerations regarding their, uh, regarding their diet? Uh, good question. I have very little um, uh, knowledge of the breed. Um, I will say I've done I've done a lot of international travel. Uh, been to both Colombia and Brazil. Never Argentina though. Um, but uh, only from my work there have I I seen or learned about some of the the more the Peruvian breeds. Um, but I will say I don't consider myself an expert in uh, what is specific uh, in terms of the diet for that breed. 
Um, I would have to look into it more, but really what I would start with is treating them as performance horses, um, treating them as highly exercising, uh, you know, whether or not they're competitive, they're still exercising. Um, and I would definitely treat them as such. Yeah, and the last question is, would you like to go on a horse riding holiday in Argentina and discover the gaucho culture and Argentina landscape on Peruvian Paso? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I have always loved to travel around the world and I love to see the culture and uh, and the different horses. And while I've never actually been on a riding vacation, but when I have gone to speak or, or give talks in other countries, I just, I love doing tours at different farms and just learning more and more about what that culture has to offer. Um, and I, I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, well, well done. We, we, we finished our interview. I would like to thank you again for your time and uh, congratulate you again for your award uh, on for uh, for your area of, of expertise and uh, well we'll tell you uh, we breed our horses uh, as I tell you on on open field they eat natural they graze with natural pastures and some supplements of course and we and and they are trained a lot uh, mm -hmm. for for our, for our our trails in the in in the entire Argentina uh, the, we are uh, we we have a, a trail a special trail uh, uh, over the the Andes mountain range uh, mm -hmm. so wow. uh, yeah <laughs> so that uh, sounds fantastic <laughs> it's fantastic it's beautiful and um, uh, uh, and they have a lot of experience we we train a lot our horses are especially bred and trained for horseback holidays. Oh, wow. Well, that sounds very nice. Hopefully someday. <laughs> okay. I hope uh, we can meet someday. As soon as I got the interview posted, uh, I regarded the link to uh, I forwarded the link to you. So we keep in touch. Sounds good. Well, thanks everybody for listening and thank you again so much for the invitation. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Bye. Okay. <laughs>